Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. So big news out of Japan. Are you holding your breath? They actually raised interest rates. That's right. <laughs> and a lot of people forgot. In fact, I forgot that they were the last central bank to have negative interest rates. They still had negative interest rates as of yesterday, even though they had significant amount of consumer price inflation. Just, just crazy what they've done over the last few decades. But let's get right into the story, and then we'll try to connect the dots and see how this may impact Japan or the global economy moving forward. That's what's really important. So I'm going to shoot over to CNBC first and foremost. And title of this article, Bank of Japan just made a historic rate pivot. Now, here's where I've got to try to not get frustrated because they're talking about this unprecedented historic move by the bank of japan and you know whenever they refer to the central planners they always talk about them making a bold move well this was bold very very bold as if they took rates from negative five percent to five percent now at the end of the day they moved rates by a whopping 10 basis points 10 basis points as if that's <laughs> like if you're a consumer i mean think about that well oh my gosh we we're ready to spend all this money by hiring more people giving raises doing all of this r d really growing our business creating more widgets we we're going to take all of this risk whoa whoa time out interest rates just went up by 10 basis points Okay, well, in that case, forget everything I just said. <laughs> Hit the pause button. We're not doing anything with our company now. Holy cow, 10 base. Whoa, hold on there. <laughs> I mean, give. it's just so ridiculous that we give them this much power and this much control, or we assume that they have this much power and control to where something like this would actually matter at the end of the day. But I'm going to stop my, uh, I'm going to get off my soapbox here and get right back to the article. T key talking points, Bank of Japan Governor Kazu Yuda had repeatedly said that talks would be key sustaining price increases. Okay, so we're going to point out a bunch of fallacies here. First and foremost, the wage price spiral. That has never made sense to me, ever. Even when I first started studying this stuff back in 2012, and I didn't know anything. I didn't know what a yield curve was. I didn't know what the Fed, nothing. When I first heard about this wage price spiral, I was like, how does that work? Because if the businesses aren't making more money, yes, they're paying more wages, but their profit margins are decreasing. Therefore, they have less money to spend even though their employees have more money i mean isn't that pretty much a wash and then how does that pan out with their share price and doesn't that impact the purchasing price or the purchasing power of their shareholders which are basically the average joe and jane with their pension fund out in the real economy so it just it seemed very circular but then when you add the viewpoint of the monetarist in other words how are we increasing inflation or consumer prices when money supply growth is negative? At a certain point, I don't care how much wages go up, you, you get to a ceiling where the businesses just can't afford to do it. There's, there's just, the, the money supply is actually decreasing. A lot of times velocity is increasing. Therefore, their cash flows can't support it. And even if you do have those wage increases that are mandated by the government, let's say, they can't afford to pay it, they go bust. And then you go from having all of these people making more money to a good majority of those, or let's just say a higher percentage of those people making no money whatsoever. And therefore you do have a small group that can't afford the higher prices, but a much larger group can't even afford what they were buying to begin with. And so you, you get this weird dynamic where overall prices are coming down, but some prices are going up while other prices are coming down just to a greater degree. So my point there is, sure, there's some validity, maybe, 
behind the wage price spiral, but not in a vacuum. You've got to, in your analysis, include, I think, money supply growth. In other words, what the banks themselves are doing. So much of this goes back to the banks. These people on CNBC and these talking heads, they like to separate the two. And in fact, they don't even like to separate the two. They don't even pay attention to the banks as if they, they don't really matter. As if the banking system in general is just kind of like Chipotle, <laughs> like some restaurant, some retailer. Oh yeah, Chipotle is closing down a few shops. Oh, whatever, no big deal. You're going to have to get Chinese food instead of Mexican food. No, no, no. The, the banks, it starts with the banks. Well, I shouldn't say that. The banks are just as important to the real economy as the real economy is important to the banks. You, you cannot differentiate between the two. Show me the economy that's doing extremely well with the banks collapsing. Just show me that economy. It's not going to happen, at least in the modern age. Now, I'm not sure, saying that's right or wrong. It's just the way the system is set up right now. So to sit there and ignore uh, what's happening with the money supply and or bank credit, I, I just, it never made sense to me. And it makes even less sense to me today now that I understand the system a lot better than I did in 2012. Okay, getting back to this here. BOG, BOJ policy makers expect higher salaries. Okay, there we go. Talked about that. The decision Tuesday sparked sharp sell-off in Japanese yen. So this is what didn't make sense to me. Because you always hear about interest rate differentials being so important. And I think in the short term, they are. I mean, I'm not saying that it's like a 100% guarantee. There's no certainties. And you can point to times when interest rates are going up with one currency and down with the other. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that currency, excuse me, is gaining value against the others. But the Japanese yen, it's such a major currency. I would have, if you would have told me, hey, George, if they raise rates, what do you think is going to happen to the yen? I'd say probably going to increase. It's going to appreciate a little bit versus the dollar. But we saw the, the opposite happen. So when I was going through this article, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, maybe the market itself was expecting the BOJ to be a little more hawkish. It is true that they raised interest rates by a whopping 10%. And I'm not saying that they were expecting more than that, but I think it's more so the central bank speak that came out in the press release or the press conference they gave after they made the announcement that they're going to increase interest rates. And what I'm talking about there is yield curve control or just quantitative easing, if you want to call it that. We're going to get to that in just a moment. So Bank of Japan decision came just days after Rango. So Rango uh, and this Shunto, if I'm pronouncing that right, I guess they do this once a year in Japan, and it's where the unions, get the labor unions get together and they negotiate with the corporations specific wage increases for their workers. And it impacts, from what I gather, the vast majority of workers in Japan. And last year, it was it set all records because the increase in wages was 3.7%. And they were able to justify that based on the rate of inflation and whatnot. But that was the highest wage increase in decades. Right off the top of my head, of, I believe it was the last 30 years. Now, what's really interesting is this Shunto period, wages increased even more. I don't know if they state it in the article, but I believe it was over 5%. Let me read here. So the trade unions said ongoing Shunto wage negotiations between Japan Inc. and unionized employees have so far yielded a provisional weighting average of 3.7 spike in base pay. This was even more robust than last year's gain. I'm not, they're using a different metric there because what I read was over 5%. So maybe this is because it's a weighted average. But the bottom line is this year was even higher, much higher than it was last year. And last year was the highest increase that they had seen over the last 30 years. BOJ, uh, governor, had repeatedly said these talks would be key to sustainable price increases Keep in mind, in Japan, they think that's good. That would inform any decision to hike rates for the first time in 17 years. 17 years. Wow. 
So if you think the central banks have all the power, if you're someone that believes the Fed has all the power, how do you explain this? How do you explain the Bank of Japan? Doing QE, what, what are they on? QE 400? And negative interest rates for how long? I mean, what, a decade? I don't know when they went negative to begin with. I think maybe 2014 or so, something like that. And the first rate hike in 17 years. So how powerful could the BOJ possibly be? And keep in mind they're doing all of that to create consumer price inflation and to turn around the economy. <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, you just have to look at them and say, let's just call a spade a spade. You are completely and totally impotent. What you're doing isn't making a difference at all. I mean, you could, I guess you could try to argue a counterfactual, but I think that just using good old fashioned common sense, you've got to come to that conclusion that whatever it is they're doing probably ain't doing much. Seeing as how they've been doing it for 30 years and they still haven't been able to achieve the results that they're trying to achieve based on their own metrics. So prior to Tuesday, oh, here we go. BOJ policymakers expect higher salaries to lead to virtuous, virtuous, what? Why would make it sound like it's positive or something? Virtuous spiral with domestic demand fueling inflation. Uh, again, you, you've got to completely remove yourself from logic and common sense and put on your, your Keynesian hat and look at it through that lens. Or else it's just like, I, 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 I remember those cartoons where they would do that, or it just didn't make sense at all. And that's, it's like reading one of these policy statements from the central bankers. And you know what? That actually give, gives Keynes a bad name. I don't want to go too, over, too far off on a tangent. But when I took the time off, I was listening to just audiobook after audiobook after audiobook. And Keynes's policies outside this, this government stimulus and whatnot, he was actually obviously a very, very smart guy. And it, his policies get a bad rap. They really do. Because what people consider Keynesian economics right now is a far cry from what Keynes actually preached. But anyway, getting back to this here. Not that I'm a big fan of his, but you got to admit that what we have now is a, a complete bastardization of the policies that he proposed way back in the day. But getting back to this here. Okay, so you've got to see that as a, a good thing. So wages go up, inflation goes up, demand aggregate demand goes up. That's somehow good, and that's what the BOJ policymakers are expecting, and therefore they say we can normalize rates. We can go back to 0%. Wow, whoo, Paul Volcker times. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the, their argument, I guess. Prior to Tuesday, the BOJ had barely budged from its ultra-loose monetary policy. Here we use these words that they always use, ultra loose. Now it's ultra cheap money, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's loose. In fact, how could you argue that money was loose? If anything, it was tight. That's one of the main reasons that you have the deflation and the problems that they have had to begin with. So money is the opposite of loose. So just because it's cheap doesn't mean that it's, in fact, just because it's cheap, I should say, often means that it's actually tight. Okay. Uh, despite their core core inflation. The BOJ will now look to utilize short-term rates. Okay, and this is where they said that they boosted it from negative 0.1%, negative 10 basis points, to zero. Or maybe, maybe if we get super, super bold, we'll go up 20 basis points whew, to 10, <laughs> to positive 10. Shortly after the BOJ made the announcement, large banks in Japan announced they would raise interest rates on ordinary yen deposits. So this is another thing that I wanted to point out. You have to ask, is it the chicken or the egg? And you guys know my position. I don't think the Fed really has much power at all other than just bailing out in crisis situations. And obviously they do. But in normal times, you say, well, the Fed is keeping interest rates artificially low. Well, I don't know. Are they artificially low or are they artificially high? Just because they're lower than what we've seen in the past just doesn't mean that the market would produce a rate that was 10 times higher 
you don't know. The market might have produced a rate that was actually lower. And I think that we can point out times throughout the U.S. history where that would definitely be applicable, or you could argue that for sure. But what they're saying here, as far as uh, you know, the banks just going right along with whatever the BOJ is saying, I think that might be what happens often with the Fed, is that the Fed makes their decisions, or Jerome Powell makes his decisions based on what Jamie Dimon tells him to do. And I would be very, very surprised if Jerome Powell didn't run his decisions through Jamie Dimon or fill in the, the blank banker prior to making an announcement. So is it the banks that are calling the shots or is it the Federal Reserve? And let's remember that who's the biggest shareholder of the Federal Reserve? Oh, right. That would be JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon. And then also you got to look at how the Fed follows the two-year treasury. They're following, they're not leading. So again, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I think there's a strong argument, which is why I wanted to highlight this and point it out, that the banks are actually leading the way and the central banks are actually just following whatever it is that they want them to do. And that would, by the way, that would be very consistent with a lot of the annual reports that I've read from the Federal Reserve prior to QE when they kind of summarize their open market operations for the entire year. In other words, how many reserves they would put in the system. It was all based on how much the banks were lending. It was never, ever, ever about, oh, we want the money supply to be this, so we're only going to produce this many bank reserves. Never. It was always how much lending are the banks going to do, therefore how many reserves do we need to give them based on whatever it is they want to do so we don't constrain them in any way, shape, or form. It was the exact opposite of what you hear in the mainstream media. Okay, so other highlights. Now, here's where we get into why the yen might have, I don't want to call it crash, but went back to, up to 150 to the dollar when you would think that it would have done the opposite. So they said they would abolish yield curve control. You guys are going to love this. So they came out and said, okay, that yield curve control, we're going to get rid of that. When I saw this, I was like, wow, okay, that's really big news. Forget the interest rate spike. The fact that they're coming out and saying that they're going to let the market control interest rates on their government debt, I was like, oh, okay, now this is something that is or could have a huge market impact. But then you got to read the fine print and they say, yeah, we're going to stop yield control. But all this QE that we've been doing, we're going to keep doing that. <laughs> so it's, it's just absurd that they're coming out and saying that, yeah, we're not going to do yield curve control. But the, the, the mechanism by which we implemented yield curve control, we're still going to do that. So it's just, we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to call it something else. There you go. Which, again, just highlights how ridiculous these central bankers are. So the BOG, the BOJ pledged to gradually slow its purchase of commercial paper and corporate bonds with the aim of stopping this practice in about a year. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. We've, we've, where have we heard that one before? It would resort to nimble responses. Oh, wow. Now these guys are so clever. They're so good that we can start calling them nimble. Whew. Man, imagine if you had failed for 30 years straight. You had failed miserably, miserably. And the mainstream media continued to refer to your actions as nimble. Wow, that's some cognitive dissonance <laughs> right there. Or at the very least, some serious, serious spin. Okay, Decision Tuesday sparked sharp sell-off. There we go. Here's a chart of the yen versus the dollar. You see it. I think this is real time. So up around 150. And this is one thing that I point out to people that are very bearish on the U.S. Treasury market. Look, I get the whole supply argument. Like nobody in the Treasury market doesn't understand that the United States deficits are going to explode. And they're going to continue to go higher and higher and higher and higher. And the interest rate costs are going to, is going to absorb more and more and more of the tax revenue. Nobody disputes that. But you got to look at it from a standpoint of a Japanese investor. 
So let's just assume that your inflation rate there is 2%, 3%, but you're getting 5% on a U.S. Treasury, while at the same time, your currency is going from, let's say, 130. And let's actually go back more than that. Your currency is going from 100 to 150. So your currency, the, the dollar, in other words, is appreciating by 30% against your currency, while your local inflation rate is 3%. And plus, you're getting a 5% yield. Why would you not want a U.S. Treasury? When you look at it from a U.S.-centric view, it doesn't make any sense. But you've got to step out, step back, and look at the bigger picture. If you want to determine what the probabilities are as far as the supply, de de uh, the supply and demand dynamics within the Treasury market itself. So, and here's where they reiterate uh, the BOJ scrapped its yield curve control framework. That doesn't mean it will lead to sharp rise in yields. Why? Because they're not doing anything different. <laughs> in fact, they're still going to do, uh, they're still committing to QE purchases of, of 6 trillion yen per month, but they're not doing yield curve control. It, it's just like Jerome Powell coming out in 2019. Remember after the repo blow up? And he's saying, well, we're going to start buying bonds, but whatever you do, don't call it QE. Come on, who are you trying to kid? That's one of the things that frustrates me most about these central planners is they just talk to you and they treat you as though you're totally stupid, as though you're not going to be able to see through this. And maybe they've got a point because the mainstream media never calls them out on it. So then they go into some of the longer term concerns. And this is where we start connecting the dots with the carry trade. Now, if you don't understand the carry trade, it's, it's super simple. All you're doing is just borrowing in yen at, let's say, 0% or 1%. And then you're taking that money, turning it into dollars, and then buying U.S. treasuries at 5%, levering up, pocketing the spread. Obviously, you've got FX risk. So what happens is when the yen starts to uh, depreciate or go up on that chart against the dollar, you're like, whoa, we can't do this anymore. Because now all of a sudden the trade doesn't make sense, way too much risk. So we're going to go ahead and sell those treasuries and we're going to take those dollars and buy back the yen so we don't have this FX risk. So the argument there is that's going to dramatically impact the demand for treasuries and therefore you would expect the yields to start to go up. Now we have seen yields go up recently, but they're still looking at the 10-year relative to Fed funds, 100 basis points inverted. So whenever you have the long end 100 basis points inverted, that in and of itself, that price, the price signal that you're getting is saying that there's massive demand for treasuries. Another thing that I think is a fun thought experiment, let's just assume for a moment that the yen was still back down at 100 because we've had this carry trade argument from 100 all the way up to where we are today at 145, 150. So... I, Look at what that's done. You could say maybe it's impacted demand. Okay, great. But demand is still almost at an all-time high. When If you want to use the inversion as a proxy for the demand. And so I don't know that this yield curve, I mean, could it impact it? Sure. Is it a cross current? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't think this is something where you're going to see the long end of the, you're not going to see the 10-year treasury go from 4.3% up to 7% just due to this unwind from the carry trade or else we already would have seen it. On that note, I want to go over to another chart really quick. And here's the inflation rate, Japan. I wanted to point this out earlier when we were talking about the increase in wages. So their argument for the BOJ is that, oh, wow, now we've got this 5% increase. So we've got all this wiggle room to increase rates and it's not going to impact the economy because of the wage price spiral. And oh, by the way, forget what the banks are doing because they don't matter. I'm right? just trying to sweep that one under the rug. But if that's the argument, why did not why did it not play out in 2022 and 2023? Because remember, in 2023, they had a, a slightly lower increase, but it was the highest increase that they had seen in 30 years. And what happened to consumer price inflation in Japan in 2023 when they had the highest wage increase that they've had in 30 years? Oh, the inflation rate, as measured by the government, went from 4.3% down to 
So the fact that they're now arguing that this year, oh my gosh, look out, we're going to get hyperinflation. When last year, they had an increase of, call it, 1% less, which was a, a historic, almost unprecedented increase, and it didn't lead to inflation, it led to more disinflation. So this could be what the market's actually sniffing out because they could be saying, all right, well, they're increasing rates, but what they're, they're increasing rates into an economy that's basically in recession. So looking out six months or a year, that means that whatever stimulus they were doing before, they're probably going to have to do more of it. So the fact that they're raising rates is just likely increasing the odds or the probability that they're going to have to decrease rates again in the future. And maybe, just maybe, that's what the currency market is sniffing out. I'm by no means an FX trader, but that's just kind of, that, that's just me connecting the dots for you real quick. Take it for, for what it's worth. So getting back to this. Okay, so Briscoe, looks like it's this specialist guy here, thinks that it will take some time for the BOJ to make more changes to the benchmark interest rate, pointing out they don't want to scare people off with short rates going up aggressively. In other words, with the yield curve massively inverting, which is probably what would happen if they continue to increase rates. Which in and of itself tells you that they probably shouldn't be increasing rates and that the market would probably have rates, who knows, maybe even lower. And you say, George, how can you say that when they're buying all these bonds? I don't know. I know it doesn't make sense. Go back and look at QE when the Fed did it. One, two, three. What did interest rates do? They went up. They didn't go down. And then when they did QT, by the way, that's when interest rates actually did go up. Or excuse me, that's when interest rates actually did go down. The opposite of what you would expect. So at the end of the day, we have to remember that it's all about inflation and growth and inflation expectations at the long end of the curve. Okay, there you go, guys. Lots of stuff going on at Global Macro. Big news there in Japan. We'll have to wait and see how this plays out. My guess, just guess, is if we fast forward six months or a year, they're probably going to have negative interest rates. <laughs> probably going to have negative interest rates again. But this will be fun to sit back and see how it plays out. All right, I want to remind everyone to go check out rebelcapitalslive.com right here. Guest speakers, this is May, guys, coming up, May 31st. If you get your tickets right now, you're going to get it at a cheaper price. So you definitely want to do that ASAP. Mike Green is going to be there for the first time. It's going to be incredible. Obviously, my good buddy, Kenny McElroy, talking about the real estate market. And, uh, you know, Kenny, Josh, how many tenants does Kenny have? Over 10,000. Over 10,000. So one of the things that Kenny's going to be talking about at Rebel Capitals Live is what he is seeing with his tenants, how they're struggling to maybe pay rent or maybe not struggling, and the takeaways that we can use to look at the economy and to make predictions about the economy or the health of the economy using Kenny's incredible insights with these 10,000 uh, tenants as kind of an input to that. That's going to be some... Very valuable insider information. Snyder, we got Hartman. McIntosh is going to be there, everyone's favorite. Mark Moss, Joseph Wang. Rich Cooper talking about red pill stuff. Barnes talking about freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. We're going to have a few more uh, that we're going to add as we get closer to the event. Oh, Josh is going to be a VIP guest. Viva Fry going to be there. Most likely Van Meter and a bunch of other peoples that you're, people that you're going to want to meet, hang out with. It's going to be a great time, great community. Tons of actionable advice. So get your tickets to Rebel Capital Live ASAP at rebelcapitalslive.com. And as always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. See you in the next video.